actually going to continue with our mountaintop schedule. I, I, I said that we would not only present experts on public policy, leaders and decision makers from near and far, that we would have a few global folks in the House. And we have, uh, as our next speaker, such a person. Her title, I want you to get this. She's the Chief Diversity Officer for the New York Federal Reserve. I, I want you to hear that again. She's the Chief <laughs> Diversity Officer for the New York Federal Reserve. They're not going out of business. <laughs> they, they don't have a cash flow problem. Okay. And, and so we decided that we, we, we're not starting on this level. We're, we're doing mountaintop stuff because we want to hear from the very best, the biggest, and the baddest who are doing what they're doing. So if you are at an agency, we don't want you to go back and say, we couldn't find anybody. Uh, we, we don't know how to do it. Uh, you're going to hear from the people who, are, who personify best practices. Uh, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. The wheel has been invented. And so not only is she the chief diversity officer, I just love to say it, Cass. <laughs> she's the chief diversity officer for the New York Federal Reserve, but she's a woman of faith. She's the chairperson of the board of trustees at the New York Theological Seminary. Th th those are the people who teach the preachers. So, so, so we're talking about a woman of integrity, character, commitment, and substance, a woman of faith. So if you have a recorder on your iPad or on your cell phone, you might want to record this. Uh, you want, want to tell somebody that I was there when history was made at NYU. Ladies and gentlemen, my friend, the Chief Diversity Officer for the New York Federal Reserve, Diane Ashley. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I mean, what do you do when you have a send-up like that? <laughs> <laughs> right? Is he, really, is he really starting it out? Well, I really think really what he's trying to do is just be an advertisement for New York Theological Seminary because he can't help it departing from his Baptist roots and intersecting that with city and state government. I mean, it's a powerful mix. Would you agree? <laughs> yes. And so I'm really delighted to be here this morning, and I really want to uh, thank uh, your organization for the opportunity to share a little bit with you about what's going on at the New York Fed. And, and, and uh, if you don't mind me saying it, Jacques, I will say this to you. It's nice to have such a wonderful room of people, a diverse room of people, and we didn't even have to use the convening power of the New York Fed. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say this also with you, and I want to spend a few moments telling you a little bit about what's going on at the New York Fed around diversity and inclusion, and we are truly supporters and committed to it. As I walked in today, and I had some prepared remarks, and I said, OK, what do we need to do? What is our message? But when I came in and I talked to a few of you, and I heard the energy that's in this room and the dedication, saw some friends, old and new, you know, it kind of reminded me back to that great philosopher, Mike Tyson. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, everyone has a plan until you get hit. <laughs> so. <laughs> With that in mind, <laughs> we're just going to go real quickly and talk a little bit about the New York Fed. The New York Fed, you know, it's an interesting organization. I've been there for five years in July. It's hard to believe. I was actually hired by Tim Geithner, just to kind of let you know the world was a little different in 2007 <laughs> for all of us. And, you know, I was hired as the first chief diversity officer in the Federal Reserve System. And so it's really been a startup opportunity over the last five years. And it's been a wonderful opportunity because, just as I said earlier, until you get hit, who in this room would have foreseen what was going to be happening in 2008? Nobody. Thank you. <laughs> I certainly hadn't. So you know, with that in mind, I mean, put yourself back in the shoes of someone who has to start something new. You're working in an institution that's been fairly insular. Would you, how many of you know a lot about the Federal Reserve? OK. Big one hand up. <laughs> um, you know, we're responsible, obviously, for ensuring that the, the smooth transition, that payments are made, et cetera, et cetera. And we really wanted to ensure as an institution that we are thinking about diversity and inclusion. So I embrace what you're trying to do today. And I just want to share with you a couple of things that we did 
on that journey. One, we started a diversity advisory council. You needed, those of you who work in agencies, I, I guarantee that it would be something to help you. But before you even do that, I would recommend that you really kind of make sure that your senior management is, is on board. Your senior management, your president, your executive officer, your executive director, they have to be on board with what's happening. Then you bring your senior management in. And what we tried to do with the Fed was something kind of unique. We wanted to kind of do a top-down, bottom-up initiative. So what we did, as soon as I came to the bank, was put together employee resource groups. Now, a lot of people in some companies call them affinity groups. We were, I was, you know, I was really, really emphatic that when we started our employee resource groups, they were going to have to be groups that were business focused. And why was that? because we wanted to ensure that employees got the buy-in, we wanted to ensure that they had professional development opportunities, we wanted to ensure that they got an opportunity to go out into the workforce and into the community. We wanted to get folks out of that building at 33 Liberty Street and out to you. So how do you do that? So you started to, I started taking our groups out on benchmarking best practice visits, having them come back in, having them get exposure. And I will say this, if you are involved in those kinds of initiatives in your particular organizations, it will change the environment. In the course of our five years, we've had employee climate surveys that have been done every other year, and we can markedly see an increase in employee engagement. And why is employee engagement important? Say it again. Productivity, Productivity exactly. Productivity. Loyalty, integrity, understanding, better, a broader perspective on what's happening. You're talking about diversity and inclusion. You're talking about the new agenda. How can you have anything new unless you have the three tenets that we abide by in diversity and inclusion? We look at diversity of people, thought, and perspective. People, thought, and perspective. You've got to have all three. Why do you have to have all three? Anybody want to be brave? Wake up. <laughs> Say again. Takes three to make it successful. That's true. The other reason why is because you can have a group of people that all look the same, but if they all think the same, we're going to be in trouble. What happened on Wall Street? What happened with the boards of directors on the firms in Wall Street? Thank you. They all look the same a lot, too. <laughs> um, so what we're trying to do is really trying to populate that. We're trying to kind of broaden our perspectives for everyone. And what is the bottom line? Why is that important at the end of the day? You know, you, a lot of my colleagues in the chief diversity officer practitioner world come from consumer-based organizations. It's a real easy argument to make when you're at Coca-Cola or McDonald's or P&G, Pepsi, because you, you can reflect your immediate consumer in terms of like, what's the business case for doing that. But if you're working in professional services, as we are, sometimes it's harder to make that case. And so there, if you want to make a case, you've got to engage your people. So I just want to leave you basically with a couple of thoughts. One is, if you are engaging your people, then you get the buy-in. If you get the buy-in, then you get the people that, who want to really start to take a little bit more risk. And once you start to really prove the case and people start to understand it, guess what? You know what, this is not just helping me in diversity and inclusion. This is not just helping the usual suspect populations. Oh, did I say that? We set up diversity and inclusion employee networks. We have 10 now. We had none in 2007. We have 30% of our employees that belong to one, two, or three networks. And we are launching our 10th network tomorrow. It is the Veterans Network. So we represent every kind of interest you can want, from working families to women to African Americans to LGBT. We really are a good representation of what's happening right now in the community. And we tie all that together simply, and what, what does that do? That creates the hospitable environment to do this, to do the new agenda, because when you want to launch supplier diversity, you've got to have that buy-in of your management. And once you do, then you can do what we did last year, and I really encourage you to continue, those of you in agencies, to do it again. Last year, as you know, well, President Obama created Section 342. It's a little section in the Dodd-Frank bill which calls for creation of offices of minority and women inclusion. It basically calls for each one of the regulators to have this role. So today, I wear the CDO role, but I also wear the Office of, director of the Office of Minority and Women Inclusion. 
You can read about it on our website if you'd like to hear more about it. But what we did last year, and I think it's really helpful, and I think it speaks to what you're trying to get accomplished today, is simply to bring in firms, new firms, minority broker-dealer, pension firms, to the New York Fed to meet who? Our primary dealers, our counterparties, put them together in a room for the first time, bring them in with our senior management, have it kicked off by our president of our bank, Bill Dudley, and our first vice president, Christine Cumming, and really start to start a dialogue. Because you know what? People do business with people they know, like, and trust. You can't have anything happen without first building a relationship. And so with that, I really just want to encourage you, salute you, congratulate you for starting your new agenda. You can't have anything new until you've got some innovation going on. And I encourage you to think a little bit outside of the box as you continue to move into this whole process, into this panel. And I certainly am make myself available through Reverend DeGraff if you have any questions. With that, I tell you thank you, and I wish you a wonderful conference. Think outside the box. That's what she said. If you want to make money, think outside the box. Now, some of us, I'm not talking to the agency folks, but you can listen in. But, but, but the folks who are, who are in business, uh, this year, and I'm going to repeat something that I said that has some controversy to it. Uh, every year we have the Black and Puerto Rican Legislative Caucus in Albany. And, and I've been going up, last year was my, this year was my 33rd year. I said I'm not going anymore. Because some of you all are supposed to be in business are just playing at business. Uh, networking is not giving somebody your business card. That, that, that is not networking. Networking is making eye contact, getting their business card, calling them. There's no reason they should call you. And setting up a lunch and establishing a relationship. Because there's no point in having these programs and the doors being open and you're not increasing your capacity if you're not taking it seriously. Because it's not a social program. You all have friends and family. At least you look like you do. Uh, but, but if you want to take care of business, then, then, then you got to be business-like. And you got to pay attention to the bottom line. So I'm not going to Albany ne next year. Don't look for me, OK? Because I'm not going until they have an action item agenda. I'm not talking about the same workshops and the same things that we talked about. That's why we're here today. We're here today because we're setting a precedent that all the, the top officials, the current and the future officials, are coming before this community to explain what they're doing and why they're doing it and how they're doing it. And it's not talking about uh, somebody got locked up, they got beat up, they got shot up, or they got shut up. We're, we're, we're talking about making some money, about business, creating jobs in the community. So we're serious. How did this begin? It began a while ago when we were doing the negotiations Walter Edwards from the Harlem Business Alliance will remember. We, we were doing negotiations, Lorraine, for the PLA. And, and we had just been brought to the table. Um, Brother Miller, the PLA is the collective, the trade unions and the city were negotiating. Talks broke down. And in that time, we were, we were because of people like Leroy Comrie and Inez Dickens, they persuaded City Hall to let the MWBE community come in. But at our first meeting, there was a contentious spirit in the place. That means that somebody didn't get the memo. And, and, and that person was shooting at us. And, 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 and one of our members was getting red behind the ears. And, 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 and tensions were high. But a leader stepped forward in that moment. His name was Kaz Holloway. And, and he put the train back on the track. And then he invited us to the big table. And, and the rest is history. When the collective bargaining, the precedent setting collective bargaining agreement was signed on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, I said at that time in my remarks that the secret weapon of City Hall is a man named Cass Holloway. Now, now George told me the reason I did that is because I figured now we just signed this contract, Emily, and I had a friend at City Hall, and in five days he was promoted to commissioner of DEP and he was gone. <laughs> So I'm not going to say too much good things about Cass because I want him right where he is. <laughs> but he has been a, a person who has been a game changer. He has heard and he has made a difference. Uh, the, the, you will have a lot of people 
Nympha, there are a lot of people who go to meetings, and that's the end. That, that's what they do. They go to a meeting to talk about the last meeting and the next meeting, and should we have another meeting? But Taz Holloway talks about what are we going to do? Some people talk about the number of firms that are certified. I, I want to talk about the number of firms that got contracts. And, 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 and so I'm turning this presentation over. Well, you're going to hear a presentation over from Cass Holloway, the deputy mayor for operations. But we have a new friend, uh, the editor of City and State. He, he just came on board, but he got it right away. I don't know how, but he got it right away. He, he said that this issue is so important. You see, city and state is important. For those of you who don't get it, this is not an ad. It's a fact. But the who's who of what's what, the elected officials, the staffs, the lobbyists, they have an online version of city and state. And we read it before we get out of bed. I'm serious. If you want to know what's happening in New York, city and state, you read that. It has the governor's schedule. It has the mayor's schedule. It has all the hearings, what the editorial boards. It, 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 you'll be intelligent for one day if you read City and State that day. <laughs> you got to read it tomorrow to be tomorrow. <laughs> but, but the point is, this editor, look at him. He's about 75 years younger than me, <laughs> but he got it. And Morgan has made such a difference in helping us pull this conference together. Because when you get on the, the agenda of the state, see, they put out special editions and they have forms. So they're going to be talking about mass transit. They're going to be talking about finance. And, and we were never on the agenda. But look at us now. People have come from all over the city to be here today, to say I was here today. And so it's only fitting and proper that I turn this important panel about New York City over to the editor of City and State, Morgan Pekpa. Thank you very much. It's such a blessing to speak after Reverend DeGraff, isn't it? Um, I'd also like to uh, acknowledge two of my colleagues who were uh, instrumental in putting this together, uh, Andrew Holt and Jasmine Freeman. This, this whole conference couldn't exist without them, so please give them a round of applause. Um, I'd like to start off by just giving a brief introduction to our panelists. Um, Lorraine Grillo is the president of the New York City School Construction Authority, which has been one of the leading agencies in, in uh, expanding MWBs in, in the city and really a leader in this capacity. Um, <laughs> Uh, Reverend DeGraff already spoke about Deputy Mayor for Operations Caswell Holloway, but I didn't read in his bio that um, when Kaz was a student at the University of Chicago Law School, he had a young, bright law professor named Barack Obama. So, uh, <laughs> and uh, lastly, John Wang is the president and founder of the Asian American Business Development Center and a leader in the Asian American business community. So it's a great pleasure to have these three leaders on our panel today. Uh, since I'm sure that many of you have far more insightful and interesting questions than myself, I'm going to open up the, um, the uh, panel at the end uh, to questions and answers. So if you could please uh, line up uh, in the last 15 minutes at the microphone so that we can all hear your questions. Uh, Deputy Mayor, what is the status of Local Law 129 that the mayor spoke of this morning, and, and what changes and, and modifications do you think need to be made to that law? Well, I'm glad. Can you, everybody hear me? Hello? Good. Okay. Um, well, I'm glad you started with something, uh, you know, superficial and non-substantive. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, before I answer your question, I do want to uh, acknowledge a few, a few people. Jacques, thank you, as always, for your understated um, comments about me and uh, about the administration. The truth is, as the mayor said this morning, um, I am one, uh, and, and he and I together today were two of 280,000 people uh, that work for the city of New York hard every day, uh, particularly on these opportunities. Uh, there are some critical people sitting in the front row here. We have Greg Myers, who is the point person at City Hall and on my team um, for these issues. We have Emily Newman, who just recently moved over to the Mayor's Office of Contract Services uh, to, um, to take on uh, this portfolio uh, and a number of other strategic projects. You know, people don't realize it, but the city has about $14 billion in procurement 
uh, that we do. And so contracting for essential city services and ensuring that there is diversity of suppliers um, and diversity in the, and, and, and maximum opportunity is critically important to just turning out the services that New Yorkers need every day, so that's terrific. And then we have uh, Greg Bishop. Uh, Lissette is also here from the Mayor's Office of Contract Services, and then Greg Bishop from the uh, Mayor's Office uh, from Small Business Services, who is heading up all of the programs that the Mayor talked about today. So this is our team on uh, NWBE efforts with the City of New York, and it's uh, really important. So make sure that if I don't get to talk to you myself after this, you talk to them. Um, Jacques and Sandra, uh, Tim Marshall and others here, uh, many other people in the room, I can't mention everybody, have been great partners and really opened my eyes to um, the serious issues that firms face. I think in the mayor's remarks, and I'm not going to repeat them, but the, the key is that it's not enough just to set goals and talk about targets. Um, there are real hurdles to getting business with the city or getting business at all that companies, and particularly small companies, and particularly small women and business own, women and minority owned companies face uh, to get this work, um, starting mo first and foremost with cash, um, and, and then bonding and requirements and so forth. And so Compete to Win is a set of initiatives that are designed to address that. Um, I want to say thank you to Renee Sachs, who is here and also helped us put together the program today. Thank you, Renee. Um, and Morgan, finally, you know, people may not know this, but Morgan and I share a mentor, and that is Henry Stern. Um, <laughs> I was his chief of staff at the Parks Department in the 90s. Morgan ran uh, New York Civic for two years before um, jumping to city and state, and Henry has a number of management rules. Um, Morgan, congratulations for um, fulfilling Rule 12 S. Um, asses in seats. <laughs> <laughs> when we used to have events, Commissioner Stern would always turn to me and say, "Are we going to have Rule 12 S?" Uh, and you know, and uh, it would be uh, so. So the turnout today is exceptional. I think because the substance is so important. Um, you asked about Local Law 29. I will go back to that and then um, allow others to speak. Uh, first, I think it's important to recognize how important Local Law 129 is. Uh, it, it was precedent setting um, in, in that it, it set goals and targets for um, contracting opportunity for city services. And so uh, it is a, uh, it, it has done a lot in terms of um, giving the city tools to work with prime contractors to ensure that we help in certain areas, uh, as many areas as possible, to bring minority and women-owned businesses in and share in that incredible portfolio of contracting opportunities across the board. Construction, professional services, um, goods, you know, $14 billion worth of, of stuff. It's an, it's an incredible portfolio that we buy. Not every dollar of that, um, uh, some of that is just straight up low bid uh, goods, but um, there is a, an incredible amount of opportunity available for um, small minority and women-owned businesses. Uh, so um, what are my thoughts on Local Law 29? Well, it, it was always envisioned that Local Law 129 would be uh, periodically looked at and updated. Uh, what, is, what does updated mean in this context? Well, you know, the point of the, the law is to set targets um, and goals for participation by minority and women-owned firms um, in, in city contracts. And those targets and goals uh, have to be set by looking at the marketplace and making an assessment of um, what's the capacity in the marketplace, and, uh, and, and how does that match up with what the targets and goals are? And I think, um, you know, the time uh, has come to, to take a fresh look at that. And I think, you know, for example, one thing in the, in the law that needs to have a serious look is right now there is a, a cap, a million-dollar cap on the um, pool of contracts that the targets and goals apply to, uh, and that's a million dollars, and that was based on a capacity assessment from 2005. You know, um, we have um, some data that, that we believe shows that that cap's no longer, uh, no longer an accurate reflection of the capacity in the marketplace. And so, for one thing, simply the removal of that cap would, uh, would, would open up the portfolio of contracts that are basically subject to the targets and goals from like $400 million to $2.2 billion. So, you know, there are some simple things that we can do uh, to make adjustments uh, that I think would be good for everybody um, and that should be done. I, you know, obviously le legislation is the prerogative of the City Council. Uh, this is not something that the, the administration is going to do on its own, but we're open to it and, I'm, and uh, hopefully we're going to, you know, um, uh, make the right, uh, make some progress there. Uh, important to recognize how much progress we've made, though. Um, 
Lorraine, uh, the School Construction Authority has been one of the best agencies in engaging and retaining MWBEs. What has been your approach, uh, your approach for involving MWBEs, and what practices have you developed that can be extended to other agencies? Thank you, and um, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I'm really, really pleased to be here today, and I also want to thank you for not having me follow Reverend DeGraff. Um, <laughs> The SCA is the model, it's, the, it's a national model, and uh, we've been a national model for over 20 years. And I've been with the agency for over 18 years. And I've seen us do very well, and I've seen us do not so well. And I also saw that we were beginning to get a little stale. So um, working with Reverend DeGraff, uh, we decided that was what was once the EEO Advisory Committee and let me just explain that for a moment. That was a committee of minority businesses and organizations and associations that would meet with the leadership of the SCA uh, once every three months or so. We'd sit down and we'd look at each other and they'd yell at us and say, you're not doing enough. And we'd yell back and say, we're doing too much. So we decided at a certain point that um, it was time to change the name and change the tone of the organization. And we sat together, uh, the members of the council, as well as myself, my vice presidents, who a number of them are here today, um, and said, how can we make this work? How can we make this much more productive? And um, we decided to change the tone a bit and to sit together and come up with different innovative ways and try them out. And that's what we did. And really, it's about a cultural shift in the organization. Um, one of the things that's really happened as a result of this partnership that we've created is that within the SCA, the different divisions and departments constantly coming up with new and innovative ways to have more inclusion and to bring up our numbers in the MWBE area. And I am just so proud to be part of that. But to me, you know, while I'm extraordinarily impressed with uh, the administration and Deputy Mayor Holloway's uh, efforts and, and all of the efforts uh, that have been made, if you don't change the culture, if you don't change the way leadership looks at, the, at uh, this program, it won't succeed. Uh, Mr. Wang, how do you, how do you, what do you see as the greatest challenge to the growth of MWBEs in the city? Well, thank you very much. First of all, I certainly wanted to uh, express my uh, thanks uh, by you know, having been invited here to speak on the NWBE issue. Uh, I've been involved, I guess, in the NWBE issue for the last 25, 30 years. I went through four governors, four mayors, and every you know, elected official that come on board, they have a new NWBE program. And so I sat on many of the NWBE boards, uh, advisory panels, uh, you know, you then then you start wondering why everybody come on board. They're going to have their own new uh, NWBE program. And after the 25 years, I look at it. I say, well, we haven't progressed very far. Why that the people are not building on the program that uh, was established by the pre uh, predecessor, and then they have to start a new program? Is the new program any different from the old program? What are some of the difference? And uh, and then ultimately, I think is that you measure uh, with the N NWBE community and uh, how far have they progressed, and uh, what kind of uh, 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 contract they have been getting, and what are the percentages that they have been getting. And I think, you know, certainly uh, here we're talking about a new agenda, and I uh, cer certainly uh, uh, cautiously optimistic that uh, things may be different uh, as we, we are moving forward. But then I guess uh, before we're moving forward, we really have to look at uh, what, what has taken place before and what is going on now, and how can we make a difference? How can we make this new, new agenda really meaningful? I guess, you know, on the, uh, just earlier on the floor, that some of the Asian American business have talking to me about uh, the local law 129 saying that the law is killing them. And uh, uh, well, as we remember, as I was part of the, uh, a group that was involved in, in uh, pushing get a local law 129 pass. And uh, at that time, of course, uh, there were certainly a lot of discussion, which was based on this disparity study. Uh, the, you know, it's called the citywide utilization goal that was established out of that. And we're supposedly to reduce disparity and to 
you know, ensure fair participation and equal opportunity in city procurement, you know, for all the minority uh, uh, businesses. And of course, out of that, that citywide participation goal, uh, let me just quote you some of the, uh, you know, for, for African American, the citywide utilization goal ranged from 7.47% to 12.63%, you know, upon the four, in, uh, four, four industry that, that were mentioned earlier by uh, Deputy Mayor. And for the Asian American, there's a 5.29% goal for one industry and none for the uh, other three industry. For Hispanic American, the goal ranged from 4.9% to 9.06%. And uh, for Caucasian female, there is no goal in one industry and 10.45% to 17.87% in the other three. Uh, zero goal, okay. So that... <laughs> Uh, and so, so I think you know maybe it's a time to to really uh, uh, come to look at is this local 129 is it still working or it has it ever worked and uh, what can we do about it? And you know before we move on to a new agenda, maybe let's look at this old agenda and see if there are things that can be uh, uh, fixed or if the you know local law law 129 is not something that's workable for the MWBE community, maybe then we ought to scrap it all together and then let's start anew. Since we every four years, we seem to start something new. So maybe this is not, not gonna hurt too much and let's just start all over again. Uh, the other point, I think that many of the, you know, in the past all this, you know, 20, 30 years, the MWBE communities, uh, the, the, the program, MWBE program, seems to be focusing more on uh, certification, and then the, that seems to be the major uh, thrust and uh, outcome of the many of this program is get yourself certified. And but as if you're certified, that you will get a contract, but that's not the case, of course. You know, people, well, you know, businesses spend a lot of time getting themselves certified and ended up, then of course they're getting nowhere. And then that's where the frustration, I think, grew, and, and the people not going getting anywhere. And while despite all this. Uh, uh, a program that, that, that's been uh, uh, mentioned and talked about. Uh, and so four years ago, actually, I had made a suggestion. I said maybe that we ought to scrap all this MWBE program and then let everyone compete on the fair and the open process so, so that I think a minority business is just as capable as any other business that, that can, can, can compete on, on, on the fair and equal basis. Uh, you know, mayor have always talking about there's 25% of a minority women-owned business in the city, but why there's only five percent or less, or you know, certainly five to ten percent, probably, the business that getting the getting contract in the city. Uh, so, so there's something that they really need to be looked at. It. So, so I think that the important thing is that we need to hold the executive, the chief executive officer, whether public sector or private sector, uh, responsible for meeting the goal. If I think the chief executive officer say, I want to see minority participation, and then that we want the city to do business with the population that we serve, and then you know, he or she in turn have to hold the people that uh, he appoints in the different agency or the, you know, a different division uh, responsible, and to have them make sure to come back to, to him uh, that, that they, are, they are meeting the goal, whether in six months, in a year, or, or however long that they set, set, set the time frame to be. I think that's the only way, I guess, you know, unless you have on the very top decide that uh, something has to be done, then I don't think, it, you know, the, the, a lot of this would be kind of an exercise in fertility. Uh, Deputy Mayor, we, we heard right before this panel from the, Diane Ashley, the Chief uh, Diversity Officer for the New York Fed. Does it make sense for New York City to have a Chief Diversity Officer? Well, before I hit that, question, let me just address some of the, the comments that were just, just made, because they, they echo something that um, Jacques said when he opened this panel, which is, uh, we don't want to talk about targets, we want to talk about contracts. Uh, we want to talk about actual opportunity um, in the hands of businesses. And this is something that, uh, and you said, uh, we change this every four years, and it's the same old thing, maybe we ought to blow the whole thing up. I don't, I don't subscribe to that idea. Uh, uh, and I think, but I do think that it is very important to frame this issue in terms of uh, opportunity and contracts that are actually in the hands of businesses who can successfully execute those contracts and then go on and get the next one. And that is what Compete to Win is about. And Compete to Win really came about through the work that I did with Jacques and the group that he mentioned, not only on the project labor agreement, which was really my first introduction to this area, but 
following from that um, and what I've heard through a couple of years of involvement in this area is there are some key problems that firms have. Uh, one is if, if it takes 45 to 90 days to get paid by the city of New York, many firms can't even bid because they don't have the cash on hand uh, to float or even get the materials they need to do a small job. Um, many of them ha would have to pay extra points to get bonds, uh, which means it prices them out of the bonding market. Other firms don't have the technical experience. Uh, I mean, look, as the mayor said, um, it's competitive out there. And the city's not in a position to just, um, you know, just hand out contracts. Uh, and we do have to uh, demand a certain level of rigor. Uh, you need to be able to keep good books. You need to be able to demonstrate that you're making payroll. You need to be able to demonstrate that you're following through on your commitments like, you know, paying uh, taxes and health care and so forth. So we have a technical assistance program that we just launched. Um, uh, we have Compete to Win is five elements. Three of the elements are uh, addressing the gaps that I just described. And then there are two others, um, mentorship. Um, Lorraine and SCA, I think it's fair to say, as she said herself, I will affirm, uh, has been a national model. I see Ross Holden in the audience here. Uh, a national model on what a mentoring program can achieve. And the question had been asked of the city for many, many years, um, well, why can't you expand this to other agencies? And because I'm going to focus on the future and not the past, uh, let's just say that the answer had been, we can't. Um, now the answer is, we can. Uh, we have $13 million worth of contracts as a start with HPD, the Parks Department, and DEP. Um, firms that sign up and enter into the mentorship program are going to work intensively with the city agencies. Bob Garofolo is here from the Parks Department. They're involved in the program. DEP, my former agency, um, surprise, surprise, they're involved in the program. <laughs> Parks is also a former agency of mine. HPD is also involved in the program um, at the small, you know, starting with the smallest contracts. And if you look at the, the way we've designed it, HPD is kind of your small couple hundred thousand dollars, Parks Department a million, a couple million, then DEP is going to be bidding out pumping stations that are going to be part of this program. Now that's a significant piece of work. And that addresses another gap in this system, which is there are agencies like DEP that have multi-billion dollar capital programs, but some of the work has been so specialized and bid out in contracts that are so large um, that only the biggest firms can possibly do it, and it doesn't make sense economically for them to, uh, you know, to break it down at a level. And even if you did, there's a question as to whether some firms could carry out the work. And let me tell you, the water and sewer system, you definitely need the most qualified firms to do that work. But we're addressing that. There's going to be an opportunity through this program for a small minority and women-owned business to compete and win in a mentorship program for pumping stations. Um, uh, so uh, there's that, and then there's a teaming program, and that encourages joint ventures with bigger firms. So I, I think that, uh, you know, I do want to, um, you know, counter the notion that what this is all about is um, just taking a look at targets and goals. Because I agree, that, that's, it's important. It's very important. So I don't want to, um, you know, uh, suggest otherwise. However, um, for my money, what the city can do is make targeted investments in helping firms to actually learn how to compete for city work and position themselves to successfully com complete those jobs so that they can bid again and increase their capacity. And that's what this program's about. Um, you asked about a chief diversity officer. I think that uh, it was great to hear from the CDO from the Fed. I've also met with the CDO from, uh, uh, from Nielsen, um, and Jacques has uh, helped um, introduce me uh, to her. And I know that it, it, is, an, it is a position that, you know, depending on what it is and what the portfolio is, uh, can be very important. I will tell you the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, we just brought in a new, um, from the uh, city employment perspective, um, citywide uh, diversity and EEO officer. His name is Fenimore Fisher. Uh, he joins us. Um, he used to be in New York, uh, and now he was actually did some work with Walmart. You might have heard of him. He just joined uh, DCAS. You'll be hearing more from him. Um, but he has two primary goals, uh, objectives. One is, first of all, equal employment opportunity is critically important, and Mayor Bloomberg 
Uh, one of the first things that he did was he mandated that all EEOs had to report directly to city commissioners. Um, having been a commissioner of a city agency, I can tell you that makes a big difference. It's critically important. I would sit and meet with the EEO in our agency every two weeks, go through the entire caseload, but also talk about how are we creating pools of people to uh, not only bring them into the agency, but also put them in management positions. You know, um, I think it was Jacques who said, or it was um, the, our, our CDO from, from the Fed who said, people hire people they know and like. This, and, 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 and if you don't put in systematic practices to widen the pool and to bring in qualified people and make it part of the, um, the systematic way that the, an agency or any business hires to bring in a diverse pool of people, you're not going to do it. Uh, it's not going to be done. And that is to the detriment of the business operation, ultimately. Um, and so we're going to be working on that issue um, uh, through agencies, uh, with, with all of the city agencies. And I can tell you it's something that um, we also created a diversity, uh, an MWBE committee at DEP for their capital portfolio specifically. So we're going to be continue to put targeted institutions in place um, to deal with contracting, but also inside city government, making sure that we are recruiting not only in the door, but as you continue through the organization, you have to look at things. Where do people fall out? Where do they leave the agency? Where are people, are there places where you're just not seeing people advance, a uh, diverse array of people advance um, to management positions? Uh, we need to look at that and we are. Um, I, I'm going to ask one more question, then we're going to move to Q&A from the audience. So if, if you have a, a question, I encourage you to, to line up. Um, uh, John Wang, you said that one of the greatest challenges to MWBs is a dearth of information. Do you, do you still feel that that's the case? And, and what can the city do to develop publicity campaigns to match MWBs with corporations looking to do business at every level? Well, I think that uh, certainly there are, uh, in the MWB community, there are many organizations uh, that have uh, been uh, dedicated themselves to uh, helping the uh, minority business or women-owned enterprises to uh, do business with the public-private sector. And those organizations need to be better utilized. And I think that uh, for a long time, I've been part of the uh, many of the you know minority business development council and so forth. And uh, uh, many of this organization are str struggling and trying to to uh, work with uh, with their members, and I think that uh, as a city or the or the private sector uh, need to put more resources into this area to uh, uh, help to build capacity of this uh, organization. Then uh, they are dedicated to help uh, their member uh, in getting uh, more involved with the uh, NWB contracts, and I think you know so so it's the capacity building. I think it's important, and then the. Uh, information and uh, uh, getting to this organization that they can filter it down to to their members that will help. Uh, I think this is a uh, uh, you know information age and uh, people certainly uh, uh, able to uh, using a variety of uh, media tools to uh, help them to obtain the information. Uh, but then you know also more importantly, I think is that the right type of information that we want to get the business to be able to get and uh, that will help them to. Uh, uh, you know, develop their business and grow their business. I'm not sure if, the, is this the microphone that's supposed to be used for questions? Or is it? Okay. Yes, we're gonna do it one at a time. Sorry, I thought you were following me. Could you, could you please identify yourself? Yes, my name is Jennifer Carey. Um, I'm actually the president of a firm called JLC Environmental Consultants, and I'm also the president of the Association for Real Estate Women which is the most well-established and oldest, I should say, we don't like to say oldest, but the oldest um, women's real estate networking and business development and educational um, association in the United States. And my question, I have two things. One is, uh, I know how slow the wheels of motion work. John Wang and I actually served on the White House Conference of Small Business in 1995, and things are still being um, uh, attempted to be changed from that uh, original um, 60, um, 60 items that we wanted to change for small businesses. But my question really is about, um, it's a per my, my company was uh, awarded a $250,000 contract in um, 2011 for the Board of Education. And uh, we have, we had our meetings, we had our, um, you know, our contract startup, we had, 
We've been over there several times to find out what's the holdup. We have not been awarded a single um, a piece of business. And it's not really, I don't want to call it business because what it is, it's, we do environmental testing. So we're going into schools. When, and I know they have these all the time because I see them on Channel 7 or Channel 11 or whatever. And the, any environmental thing that comes up in a school, we have an emergency contract, response contract for indoor air quality or other types of issues that would affect school children. So I'm just wondering, like, so we've been awarded this for two years. We've been yet to see a piece of actual work come out of it. And we don't know if our, 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 our amounts are being lumped into the success stories. And I, and I just really, it's kind of frustrating for us as a business to, you know, it's 99% of all people in America work for a small business. So we're really putting money back into the local economy and more than maybe a bigger business would. So it's really just disappointing. And I was wondering, I know it's specific to my company, but... Maybe since you're in the education, sure. m maybe someone else's contract isn't up and the money's still out there? Sure. Just a, qu just a question on how you can deal uh, with if, that as a... If I could just respond uh, th with a question. Is it with the School Construction Authority? No, I've no, done a lot of work with School Department Construction Authority. I've done 1,400 schools over our... You know, we've been in right, business for 20 right, years. Right, 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 right. Uh, because the SEA has a contract management system that we use, and w with, with that, uh, we kind of keep our sites on where we are and how much money each contract has left and how we divide up the work. Uh, we have been doing a lot of this work for the Department of Education. So it's likely, certainly those numbers are not included in our numbers as you, as you mentioned earlier. Our success story is, is, is separate from, but we've been doing a lot of the Department of Education environmental testing based upon all of the emerging issues out there for example, PCBs and the like. Right. So I think if you're not getting the work, it's very simply because uh, the work isn't being done through the Department of Ed. And my colleague is here from the Division of School Facilities, and he can probably uh, speak with you outside. But it's not because, not for lack of trying, I'm sure. It's just that the work has come over to us, and we, uh, we have our own set of contracts for environmental work. Thank you. And we appreciate, and small businesses, of course, appreciate the dialogue that's going on today. Thank sure. you so much. Hi. My name is Alfred Placeris. I'm president of the New York State Federation of Hispanic Chambers of Commerce. I serve on the uh, committee, New York City Department of Small Business Service Advisory Board. Uh, the issue that I get from my members and a lot of the people here is, is how do you get contracts if you're a new MWB? Because the statistics show, you know, they're getting contracts, but... How, how do you do business with people you know? So why should you take a new MWB and give them? So I, I like to know how you're going to get that kind of mix where you give new MWBs an opportunity to move into the contracts. Let me uh, start, and then maybe if SEA has any, any uh, advice to add. Um, well, uh, I think that uh, a couple of things. First of all, I would encourage you any new MWBE, and it may not be a new company, it may be a new company in terms of doing work for the city. Yes. Um, uh, obviously, uh, the uh, getting back, it, it is important to be certified, which um, Jacques raised, and, and that is something that we are taking affirmative steps to make easier to do and also seamless, so that as, to, as near as possible, if you're certified with the state, you can be certified with the city. It's crazy if you have to go to the Port Authority and the state and the city and the MTA and get certified with four different programs. And, you know, and, and so this is something that we're, we're actively trying to, to work on. So that, that is an important piece of um, uh, a step to take so that we know who the firm That's is. That's a given. I'm talking right. about the people yeah. who have everything. How and, do you get how Right. Do you get and so um, now th then the next is I would uh, encourage them to contact Greg Bishop right away, who's here, and look at the suite of Compete to Win programs, okay? Um, and uh, see, number one, it, are there any programs that they think uh, that any of the, the new firms who have not yet done work with the city um, want to sign up and be a part of? Uh, but you also need to be aware of the contracting opportunities uh, that are available. We did, uh, I actually personally did two forums, one right up in the Bronx for our uh, PSAC, the call, 911 call center that's a $560 million job, um, and then uh, for the Croton water filtration plant about you know, seven or eight months ago in the Bronx. So uh, those, uh, the programs are a good way to get in, but also it's really about finding and identifying the opportunities and then bidding for work. Mm -hmm. And if you're, and if you have new firms who are not bidding for work, and I can't tell you how many companies I've met with who, um, you sit down and my first question is, well, how many city jobs have you bid, bid for? And the answer is none. <laughs> uh, and so you certainly can't get work if you don't bid. Okay. 
I think we need to have metrics. So what I would uh, recommend is that you have you track how many of these contracts went to new MWBs, and if it's 5%, then something's wrong with that. So I think the thing we need here is metrics as to are we giving opportunities to the new MWBs, and the only, the only way we're going to be able to do that is if we track it. Yeah. I agree, and we will do that. We're, we are actively tracking just all of the data points for um, MWB firms and contracts, and I totally agree with you. Uh, I think we need to keep bringing new firms into the program and helping them get jobs. Good afternoon. I'm Lena Gottesman. I own uh, Altus Metal Marble and Wood for 23 years, and I also am the Vice President of Professional Women in Construction. My question is, for three years now, I've been, I've had no goals whatsoever on city work because I'm a Caucasian woman. And um, for three years we've been hearing, oh yeah, we're looking at that disparity study, which I think most of us know was flawed in 2005. And I'd like to know how soon, I know this is part of your, your, your uh, program to roll this out, but we've been waiting a really long time. And I'd like to know, did they ever find out what really went wrong with that first disparity study? And how soon are we going to see the new one? Um, and hopefully, uh, they're going to have some better goals for Caucasian women as well as some Asian Americans, which I think are not in a good place either with their goals. So this gets back to the Local Law 129 Correct. issue. And I think that um, rather than, uh, you know, I, there's only so much value in talking about the 2005 study and everything. I mean, that law has been in place for a while. I think uh, that, that the administration certainly agrees it, it's time to update the law. Uh, I, I don't think that the answer is to, um, to totally scrap and redo it. I think that uh, there is, um, it is time to update the data across the board. You know, does the million dollar cap make sense? What are the goals and targets in each of these groups? Is there a basis to make um, uh, changes and set goals in some of the areas? And I think for women contractors, um, Caucasian women contractors, well, there are targets for women contractors in a number of areas. In construction, there is not, uh, based on the 2005 disparity study. Um, I've heard a lot about that. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I have There's also- There's some big problems I've also, with that, I've and I think also, everyone knows it. And and uh, but you know it's a um, uh, getting legislation done is a is a is a multi party multi party process I think um, uh, and and I think you'll have an opportunity to hear later from uh, and I think it maybe earlier it heard from some council members on this um, we are open to looking at it and uh, I think we would like to you know to move on it and so we'll have to see working with uh, the city council, what the timeline is to do that. I can't speak without, for that. Without go getting um, really into something difficult, um, has the city looked at all their certified companies to see how bona fide those certified companies really are? And that's all I want to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, why, don't, why don't we just um, uh, unpack that question. I mean, that question gets at one of the key issues, which is uh, you want to make sure that any firm that's certified as a minority or women-owned business, um, that they're actually who they say they are and are qualified to do work and, and so forth. Um, we do enforce. Uh, we, we do l look at, uh, uh, you know, through various means. Agencies um, uh, review it. The Mayor's Office of Contract Services review the certification, small business services, and the certification process. Um, the certification process, while we are trying to streamline and simplify it, is not a easy process. You know, there there are uh, the whole point of it is to validate and verify um, for lots of reasons. You know, you you don't. The whole point of the program is for this work um, to try to be spread to as many different and diverse firms as possible. And if somebody's fraudulently putting themselves in the in the in the mix when they shouldn't be. That just means that's work going to them when it should really be going to somebody else. Um, uh, and we also have DOI on that as well. So we do look at uh, uh, quite carefully this issue. And have we looked across the board? Well, we're, we're constantly evaluating and looking at this. Um, if, you, if there are specific you know, firms or circumstances uh, where, the, uh, where anyone believes that um, something has uh, inappropriate has been done, um, you know, people know how to get me and, and the team here. Um, but I do think it's also important to remember we're not trying to um, set barriers to, to doing business with the city that are unreasonably high. So it's a balance. You know, we want to 
make it easy for firms that actually are capable of doing the work to bid on, win, and, and not just win, but successfully complete city contracts. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's all of the goals that we're trying to meet. And we're just going to take these last three questions. If you could keep your questions as brief as possible. I wonder why when I got up here you said that. <laughs> anyway, my name is Celeste Morris. Uh, a lot of people know me because I did uh, run the city's minority and women business program right at the beginning of, uh, uh, of the mayor's term. Uh, prior to that, I published the directory of African American businesses in the city, and I also um, had a fellowship at Columbia where that was my whole realm of study, minority and women businesses. One of the areas that I'm hoping that the city can uh, look at in very solid terms is sanctions or some sort of repercussion for the prime contractors who do not meet their goals, who actually don't even take it seriously that they have a goal and they know they will get another contract after they don't meet the first goal. So is there anything that the city is looking into in terms of that? Because that is one of the reasons why we constantly have this ongoing problem. The primes can just do as they like, meet the goal, don't meet the goal, and nothing ever happens to their bottom line or to their public image. My second question or a comment even in um, relationship to what Lena, the first of uh, the former speaker, was saying, uh, there needs to be established something where fraudulent companies can be reported anonymously, because the people who are out here working on the contracts, they know who the fraudulent companies are, but they are really not free to speak on it. So, can the city do anything about that? So, Lorraine and I are going to address this uh, jointly. First, in terms of reporting, if, if, if anybody uh, suspects corruption or fraud in, in any aspect of the city, uh, uh, city work, uh, whether it's the administration of contracts or anything else, um, there is, uh, we want it to be reported. So, uh, Lorraine, there's an IG for um, the School Construction Authority. Each of our city agencies has IGs. Uh, but also you can go right to the Department of Investigation, and I'd encourage you to do that. I mean, and I think that uh, in terms of confidentiality, I can personally attest to um, the main maintenance of confidentiality there, and if, if anybody's unsure of how to do that effectively, um, that's, uh, w let's have a conversation about that, but you should um, touch base with the team here, and we'll make sure if they can't answer the question today that we get back to you, so give the information, and, and I'll provide that uh, to anybody. Um, in terms of uh, uh, the, the wait, the first part of the question was oh, accountability for meeting targets. Well, first, I, I do want to dispute the idea that that um, that there's no the, the, plenty of firms, particularly recently, and and strong firms with large bottom lines have run afoul of the MWBE rules um, and and uh, are certainly paying a price for it. And I think that it's something that um, not only has uh, DOI Commissioner Rose Gilhern uh, been involved in this, but also the Eastern District and the Southern District of New York. And you know, so that's in terms of um, certain requirements and fraud there and so forth. Uh, are, there, there is a perception, I've heard this anecdotally a lot, that you know, ACOs and city agencies don't abide by the targets, they don't think about this issue. Um, and, I, and I have to say, that's really not the case. Um, Andrea Glick, who has now taken over from Marla Simpson at the Mayor's Office of Contract Services, um, you know, personally assures that the goals and the targets go out with every solicitation that the city sends out, um, and personally works with firms to you know push them to meet targets. Now, it is true that there are you know occasionally firms that don't meet it for certain job types, um, but we are stepping up um, the and and reinforcing. Um, the importance um, for city ACOs to meet the targets and and uh, and work with firms to do so. You know, I think you, you can always do a better job, but I think that we we actually do do a, a pretty good job um, pushing firms to meet the targets. Uh, it's it's not something that um, uh, uh, well, it's a challenge, and we are stepping up our work there. Uh, let me just leave it at that. 
Lorraine? Yeah. And at the SCA, I mean, we do an extraordinary job, our team under Suzanne Vieira, Craig Collins, the vice president, of tracking uh, the goals and tracking exactly where the contractors are in at various stages of the project. And where we see them slipping, we certainly are uh, out there and encouraging them along the way. And anyone who doesn't think that uh, them not meeting their goals has uh, an adverse effect on whether or not they get an another contract with the SCA is wrong. It's part of their evaluation, and they will be judged on that as well. Thank you. Please, if you can keep your questions succinct. Sure. My name is Kalpana Patel, and I'm uh, president of UCI. I'm also a president of uh, Nabo Long Island, and I sit on a couple of uh, non-profit uh, organizations, advisory boards. In uh, 2005, my firm received Mayor Michael Bloomberg Small Business Award of Distinction. And based on that award, we have been receiving a lot of meetings with New York City agencies, and we were really excited with the opportunity that was available to us as a minority business. Came the local law 129, there were no contracts, there, ne there were no networking opportunities that we used to receive between 2005 and 2007, and we were literally bleeding for past seven to eight years or so. If it was not for the federal government, New York State and New York City agencies, NIPA, MTA, LIPA, we would not have survived. And on top of it, when you talk about the capacity, my colleague here, Colin, has a capacity to handle $7 million of do-it contract, so do I. We employ the local resources right here in New York City. And when the time comes to award the contracts, because of the price, the company based in New Jersey, that they are bringing in H1s, they are winning the contracts while we are being left out of the opportunity. And this was one of the reasons that we really felt that we should bring up this issue. New Jersey doesn't allow New York-based company to compete on some of the contracts, but New York City is open to any of the firms. And I'm not saying that we need to have those barriers, but this needs to be looked at in a very fair and objective way. And as I heard before, you are Mr. Game Changer. So we are willing to... <laughs> <laughs> so my colleague Colin and I, we are willing to play the game and please help us out. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jacques. <laughs> uh, rather than um, uh, go on at length, um, why, why don't you get together with Emily right right now after this? Because I, I, we, we should sit down with you. What, what I try to do on uh, particular, even with particular firms, and I've brought in a number of firms, large and small, to talk to them about this issue is, um, why aren't they getting work? Uh, and it sounds like the firm certainly has been bidding on jobs and hasn't been getting them. and. Um, you know, the, the administration doesn't go in the direction of, we are, this is all about increasing opportunity and increasing the number of firms that can bid on city work and, you know, we want to make sure that we keep it competitive and get the best price, so I'm not going to commit to excluding New Jersey from New York contracts. Mm -hmm. but, um, uh, but I think that we need to understand a little bit better the dynamic of what's happening um, in particular, uh, and it should help us, hopefully, um, to see what steps we can take, not only for UCI, but um, other firms that are in your position, because I'm sure you're not the only one. So why don't we do that, and I'll, we'll, you know, get back to um, whoever the, we'll get back to the forum somehow on um, what steps we take. Okay, uh, final question. Hi, my name is Bansi Shah. I am past president of Society of Indo-American Engineers and Architects. Our present president, Nayan Parikh is here, future president, Mihir is here. Uh, our society has about 800 engineers and architects who are all qualified minority contractors, and they have been working in the city from 1970, 30 years, we have 30 years experience. We are there, we have been doing very, very well. But the day 129 was enacted, all the Asians and Indian are excluded from being qualified as a minority contractors. We did millions and millions of dollar work. Me personally, my own company was working as a roofing contractor in the city in from 70 all these years. My volume has been five to $10 million. It has come down to $2 million. 
Of course, the economy is bad. I understand that. At the same time, city where we are born, we are, we are, I live in the city for 35 years. City is not helping us out. City is telling us to get out of here. That's what it looks like. So what I want to do is we, when, like revamping the local 129, when the time comes, we want you to consider that new disparity study. We, are, we want to participate. We are engineers and architects. We are consulting engineers, we are contractors, we, are, we do, we are also manufacturer of material. So please do whatever has to be done as Kalpana said, game changer, please do something and, <laughs> and, and, and uh, John, John and I know each other very well. We also tried uh, about four years ago before the law was enacted and we were unsuccessful in coming up. When the next disparity study comes or anything comes, we want to participate in that. My society will participate in that and we'll be very, very, we will be very care, uh, thankful if we are given an opportunity to participate in future changes. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Uh, now, I, so I made uh, a number of comments on Local Law 129. Um, I, l let me just say, uh, we do want to make sure that w whatever happens, we want to strengthen the law uh, and, and, and do changes that make sense. We want to, uh, and to the maximum extent possible, certainly not um, exclude uh, or, or make it so that it's harder for, for groups to um, get opportunity. So uh, l let me just say that uh, that issue is, is noted and um, we'll be following up. On, on behalf of City and State, I want to thank our panelists, uh, Lorraine Grillo, Deputy Mayor Caswell Holloway, and John Wang, Reverend DeGraff. Did, did I mention that we had a keynote speaker this morning? Because <laughs> when, when they say you're going to ask a succinct question, <laughs> we heard about four keynotes and then a question. And we're trying to stay on track, and so I just want to be respectful of your time. We really appreciate your attendance here today. I want to call Brother William Miller up. Uh, we did things out of sequence, but, but the person who writes the check, uh, when the person writes a check, even if they go out of order, they're still going to go because we want to say thank you. Would you come forward representing the H Hudson River Bridges? Good afternoon, and uh, thank you, Reverend. I serve two purposes here today. Um, I'll be very brief. I know that this was a great discussion, but for Jugato USA, I serve as the MWDB program manager. And what that means to me is that I'm an advocate and I am in a civil rights investigator. And I have the opportunity to provide opportun contract opportunities to small businesses, minority women, and disadvantaged. I also serve here today as one of the representative firms of the Hudson River Bridge Constructors Joint Venture. Uh, it is comprised of Jugato USA, Flatiron, Yonkers Contracting, and Samsung CNT. We are one of four teams shortlisted for the Tappan Zee Hudson River Crossing project. It is an opportunity for us to be respectful to the small business community, to provide economically feasible opportunities to participate on that project. Chicago, she would say, being the leader of the DB program, we have small business programs and minority women business programs for not just the state projects, but for New York City. We chose to sponsor this event because the conversation is important. The content of the dialogue here today is important, not only to us, but to you. And we want to be an advocate for small businesses, for more minority and women receiving firm contracts with my firm, but also receiving contracts throughout the state. So we wanted to lend our voice to the discussion. We wanted to put dollars behind our voice to show you that we are committed, that we have skin in the game, and that we intend to follow up on the requirements that we set for ourselves and the requirements set by the governor and the mayor of the state. So I thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak. So in diversity, you have to sh show a commitment. You've got to be able to be prepared. You've also got to put your money where your mouth is, if you're interested. And we appreciate your uh, commitment and your support. Uh, now it's about to get even more exciting. Uh, uh, TV cameras are coming in. Reporters are coming in. Candidates are already here. Thank you so much for your kind attention. We look forward to the mayoral candidates roundtable, which is the next part of our agenda. <laughs> 